Um, hello and good evening North America, good morning Australia and a warm welcome to our listeners from around the world. Welcome to our Minds and Money 5 at 5 show which, to, which today is sponsored by IBK Capital and is brought to you in association with the Resource Global Network. For those of you attending Five at Five for the first time, the aim of Five at Five is to maintain engagement between investors and miners through a lively, interactive format during the current situation. A few admin announcements before we start. To make it as interactive as possible, please have your videos switched on. To ask a question, you can submit it through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. For today's show, we have a great lineup of guests. They are Mark Selby, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Canada, of Canada Nickel Company, Harry Barr, Chief Executive Officer of New Age Metals, Emily King, Principal KWR Capital and Founder of Perspective Portal, Philip Dutot, Associate of Resource Capital Funds, Rick Squire, Portfolio Manager of Acorn Capital, and Grant Moray, CEO of SPC Nickel. So let's start off with a polling uh, uh, question. So if I can ask my colleague, uh, Jackie Lamb, if you can perhaps go and get the uh, polling question up onto the screen. So the screen is, so the question is, uh, which battery green metal are you the most bullish about? And you've got a choice of five, cobalt, lithium, PGMs, copper or nickel, which all t neatly tie into uh, today's uh, five at five and the theme of today's five at five. And uh, whilst you are voting, let me hand you over to, to today's host, who's Michael White, President and CEO of IBK Capital. Um, Michael, today's Five at Five has three projects who are involved in the battery green metal space and IBK Capital are backing. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about today's Five at Five? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Andrew, and welcome everybody around the world to uh, today's panel. Yeah, I'm the CEO and president of IBK Capital, our investment bank here in Toronto, Canada, where I am right now. And uh, we have been active in the mines and metal space for 30, it'll be 32 years in February, so quite some time. It's our core, it's our specialty. And uh, yes, I'm so delighted to be hosting this panel. Uh, we have, uh, in, in addition to uh, three brilliant uh, institutions uh, and, and uh, experts, uh, who work for them, we also have uh, three companies that, uh, full disclosure, are portfolio companies of, of myself and uh, IBK Capital, um, uh, but we're super excited to have them on this panel because they all have very bright uh, futures and, and uh, we, we certainly are enjoying their, their prospects going forward. Uh, two of them are, are uh, kind of uh, lookalikes in terms of structure. Uh, we took, we helped uh, Canada Nickel go public back about a year ago. It went public in February, but we were organizing and working towards that this time last year. Um, and that, of course, is represented by Mark Selby, doing an excellent job. You'll hear from him. And then just now, as I speak, uh, I just actually got off the phone before this, co this conference started, uh, working with uh, Grant and SBC Nickel, and we're helping them go public as well, uh, raising them a few dollars here. And that's a go public uh, that should happen around uh, February or so of, of 2021. So it's, it's great to have the two. And then we also have, representing more of the green metal space, Harry Barr, and uh, he represents New Age Metals. And uh, we're super excited about that company. It's got one of the largest uh, PGM, palladium uh, resources in Canada, and it's located in a, in a prime location where Grant is as well, right up there in Sudbury, Ontario. And he's also got what I call a sleeper. He's got a lithium project. There's no value in the stock for it today. Uh, but we're going to hear more about that, and uh, and so we're super excited to have Harry Barr here as well. Um, but I'm just the moderator, right, Andrew? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn to our our institutions that we have on the line uh, here: Emily King and, and uh, Philip Detroit, as you mentioned, and Rick Squire. And uh, let's start with Emily. Just if you could spend you know 30 seconds, uh, uh, a minute, uh, letting us know a little bit about. Uh, KWR and and uh, so that uh, you know as we're all talking and having the discussion today uh, people know a little bit about uh, yourself and uh, and the institution that you that you represent. Yeah thanks Mike. I'm a geologist uh, with experience in copper and rare earths and lithium but primarily in emerging and frontier markets. I led a mining exploration program for the U.S. Pentagon in Afghanistan for several years um, and then after, after running that program, uh, became a bit of a mining entrepreneur. So I'm a principal at KWR Capital, a new private equity group that's focused on the mining industry, as well as the founder of Prospector, a new artificial intelligence platform for mining investors and mining companies to find each other. 
Um, so yeah, excited to hear about the companies today and, and looks great. like a great. And, and I think, I think that's when I met you when you were with the government. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, and just so everyone knows, where are you located right now? I actually, I hate to tell all of you in Canada, I live in South Florida. So I live just north of Fort Lauderdale and work out of my, my office right now in my new tiki hut in the backyard. So a little bit of a different <laughs> setting than the photo that, that was shared before. Well, yeah, we got to have a little sun with, with the snow, right? So that's, that's good. That's good. Uh, okay. And then uh, the next up, uh, Philip, how about you uh, tell us a little bit about Resource Capital uh, for those that might not know about it and yourself and where you are today. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so starting with myself, a mining engineer by background, but um, moved on over to the capital markets and investing side fairly early on in my career. Um, joined RCF or Resource Capital Funds four years ago. I used to be based in Toronto. Um, we have a satellite office there, but I moved to Perth about a year ago. So I'm currently sitting in Perth um, with summer just, just coming up. I'm definitely not missing those pictures of snow that we've seen uh, a bit earlier. Uh, and look, RCF is a global uh, mining focused PE fund. We have offices in uh, Denver, Perth, Toronto, Santiago, London. Um, we invest you know, across the commodity space. Um, the, the firm has been active for over 20 years now, um, successfully investing through, through mining cycles, uh, multiple jurisdictions, multiple commodities. Um, so yeah, looking, <laughs> looking to the future. Excellent, thank you, Philip. Rick, do you wanna say some words, Rick Squire? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So I, I'm a, a geologist, so, so I've um, been working with Acorn Capital uh, for uh, four and a half years now. So a Acorn Capital is a microcap fund. So we, we, we define microcaps as you know, companies uh, basically less than about a, a billion dollars market cap, but we, we sweet spot is for investments with companies between sort of uh, 20 and, and, and maybe $500 million uh, market cap. So we're an Australian group. It's one of the large, oldest uh, market cap funds in Australia. And, uh, and, um, and uh, we, we uh, uh, are looking, so I look after the resources and energy portfolios for, for ACON. And so, you know, really the, the core of that is, is getting into the details of the, the technicals around the projects as well as the financial aspects. We think that's really uh, core to, to understanding that the, the smaller companies. So, so like I said, we we uh, I'm interested in the resources and energy sector, but uh, quite excited about the sort of the EV metal space and 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 that at the moment. Excellent, thank you. Uh, well, I think Andrew, we we have this poll going on. Um, do we have the results from that or uh, should I put yes, everybody on the spot yes. and see how they voted? <laughs> well, I think we can get the polling question, uh, polling result up on the screen, Jackie, and we can see what result we had. Ah. It looks to be nickel by 1%, which might be a nice, neat sort of segue into our first presenter, Michael. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, our first presenter, then it will I close, I close that. Yeah. Um, our first presenter is Mark Selby, and uh, he's the, the CEO of Canada, of Canada Nickel Company. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a company that went public back in February of this year. Uh, he's got some great projects, uh, nickel focused projects with some PGMs, which I'm sure you'll get into because there'll be questions about that, Mark. Um, uh, up uh, just north of Timmins, Ontario. Uh, and so I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to speak for Mark, um, but we're very proud of what Mark's been able to accomplish. It's a world class deposit, and uh, it's got a lot of growth ahead of it. Mark, over to you. Great, thanks, Mike. And, and again, yeah, we're a new company. Uh, the company itself was founded privately, as Mike said, just 14 months ago, um, around the Crawford Nickel <laughs> discovery. Um, uh, can I advance the slide, or do I need to tell you to advance? Yeah, you could just, you could tell, you can yeah, tell Jeff. I've got the slide for you. Yeah, yeah go ahead to the, the uh, summary slide. So, yeah, this uh, is a rare commodity. It's a brand new nickel sulfide discovery. Uh, as Mike said, we're located uh, just north of Timmins. Uh, in that 14 month period, we've gone from having uh, the four discovery holes to a resource that's now the eighth largest nickel sulfide resource globally on just over about half the property. Uh, we've picked up five other option properties in the package and so you know we believe uh, we have you know what will become 
uh, you know, one of the largest nickel sulfide uh, discoveries ever. Um, you know, in addition uh, to having a great world scale resource, we're in a great location. We're literally uh, just up the highway, about 30 minutes uh, north of Timmins, about 15 minutes north of the Kid Creek Mine. Uh, so you have all the infrastructure you need uh, to, to, to be able to build a mine and put it in operation. And again, given the long history of mining and then in the broader Abitibi area, where you've had four of the five largest uh, uh, greenfield uh, base metal and gold metal gold mine uh, permitted in the last five years, um, you know, we're in excellent location to be able to advance this project. You know, in addition to all of those uh, factors, we're very lucky that the, the host rock for this deposit, when it's exposed to air, naturally absorbs CO2. Uh, we're in an area that's all zero carbon hydroelectricity. And, um, you know, Timmins is quite comfortable with downstream processing. So uh, we, we formed our net zero metal subsidiary um, and are basically looking to produce uh, zero carbon nickel and cobalt and zero carbon iron products out of the, out of the uh, project. Uh, we're advancing this project very aggressively, given its similarities to a project from my past life, Dumont. So a feasibility study, sorry, PEA by the end of this year and feasibility study by the end of 2021. And, you know, as the poll suggested, people are bullish on nickel and, you know, we believe nickel's headed for uh, the next super cycle by the middle part uh, of this decade. We've gone through one to the late 60s, late 80s, mid 2000s. And with the EV overlay on top of strong stainless demand, you know, we look headed uh, for, for the kind of super cycle by the middle part of this decade. Let's look to the next slide. Um, you know, the, the key differentiator of this deposit versus some, some of the other uh, large scale low grade sulfides is this higher grade core. Uh, we more than doubled it in our resource update in October. So we over, have over 200 million tons at 0.34% nickel. You know, that deposit on its own would rank as one of the larger uh, sulfide deposits in the world today globally. So you know, to have that as a starter area um, just it is um, immensely helpful for the economics of any project. And then if you go to the next slide, um, you know, we hope to find uh, multiple Crawfords. Uh, these types of deposits do form in clusters in Western Australia and in, in Northern Manitoba. And so, you know, we think by the time we're done here, we've flown, flown geophysics recently over five option properties that we picked up from Noble Mineral Exploration. Um, and, you know, we think we'll be able to add an additional two to three uh, deposits to what we have already at Crawford and additional deposits at Crawford. Uh, so again, this is a new nickel sulfide discovery. Uh, it's already one of the world's largest sulfide deposits ever found. It's the largest since the uh, late 60s, early 70s. Um, you know, and we think we'll be well timed to hit the new nickel super cycle that's coming down the path here in the next few years. Okay, that's your presentation. Very good presentation. Thank yeah. you very much, Mark. Um, I've got a few questions. I know that uh, I'm also going to turn to, to our resident experts here. Um, uh, to, to ask them a few questions. Um, there are a lot of questions about your company. Um, it's done really well in terms of uh, market value appreciation over, over the last year. Um, but if, if you don't mind, um, just spend a brief moment on your team. Um, yeah. I, you, you have particular experience with these types of deposits. Um, and so just tell us a little bit about your team, if you don't mind, so that everybody understands where you're coming from in that regard. Yeah, sure. And uh, we've got uh, Jessica Lee Wernsing from, from our team. Uh, she's been with the company um, since almost day one um, and uh, has been a key part of the success here going forward. Yeah, no, I, I spent my previous decade with RNC Minerals advancing the Dumont project from a resource stage to a fully permitted construction ready project. So, you know, as we've advanced the project here and are now into the engineering study stages, we've been able to pull key people yeah, in, into, into the team. So people like Christian Brousseau, um, who managed all the studies for Dumont and, and was involved in the construction of both uh, the Malarctic mine and the Detour Gold operation. So, you know, what we're planning to build uh, at Crawford is, is a similar scale operation. And then we pulled in key geology and mineralogy people um, that had, had been involved in, in the Dumont project on this. And so, you know, that's what, what's allowed us, you know, effectively, um, you know, we're looking to have a feasibility study done, um, you know, just over two years from, um, you know, the, the fifth drill hole on the project, which is, you know, light speed for a project at the scale. And, and it's being able to tap into that experience that has allowed us to do it. And, and that'll be how many, how many uh, months from now? That feasibility. Yeah, yeah, it'll be basically 13 months from now is when we're looking to have it done. And we're working with Asenko, um, who did all our engineering on Dumont um, through two, two pre-feasibility studies and two feasibility studies 
So, you know, with that, with that, all that experience and the similarities between the two deposits, you know, we'll be able to move very quickly. Uh, Emily, Rick, or Philip, do you have any any questions of uh, of Mark? I, I could just keep going, but <laughs> you must. No, I'd, just, I'd, love you little, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how people are reacting to your net zero approach. That that also yeah. sounds very uh, unique for for in the nickel space. Yeah, no, it's um, it, it's 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 been a been very 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 well received, and we got a lovely setup from Elon Musk. At his conference call at the end of July, talking about the you know environmentally fr friendly um, requirements for his nickel, um, you know sort of the, the dirty nickel secret um, is that you know more than 100% of the growth in nickel has come from nickel pig iron in Indonesia. Uh, to make one ton of nickel in nickel pig iron, you need to burn and uh, uh, burn 25 to 30 tons of coal, uh, which in turn generates nearly 90 tons of CO2 per ton of nickel. You know, and that's been the the sole source of supply growth for the last five years and, and the sole source going forward. So, you know, obviously that's not what the EV market's looking for. So, um, you know, from the work we did on Dumont, you know, I knew that it had, you know, that potential um, to be able to, these types of deposits to deliver it. And so, you know, we, you know, saw the opportunity and was sort of thinking all the way along with, with Canada and Nickel that we would have that, bring that forward at the right time. You know, again, more and more and more mining companies, you know, uh, you've seen BHP Billups and, um, set concrete objectives for 2030 with comp executive comp tied to achieving those goals. So, you know, the, the a project's ability to, you know, help people reduce their carbon footprint is just going to be that much more attractive. There's huge pools of capital, you know, again, mining is a capital intensive business and it's all about attracting, you know, the cheapest and best capital that you can. And so if you're able to, then to tack in, tap into, you know, uh, all this ESG capital that, that's floating around, um, by you know by being able to make concrete steps to get there you know it just just makes a lot of sense on a lot of fronts yeah because with prospector that's what we see is the non-traditional investors are more yeah. interested and more passionate about those types of uh, factors than more traditional mining investors that's a, yeah it's it's a, almost a whole new breed of investors um uh that are that are are creating mass here and uh, they very much do care about that uh, it's also the customers of these companies that care very much about where these co companies are, are getting the uh, the metals from um, it's it's amazing to see actually that consumers care that much about it that they're willing to you know put their feet there put their you know fist down and say do better do better and buy your products uh, Rick Philip do you have anything uh, you want to add or any questions of mark today yeah I just got a quick one can you Briefly outline the um, uh, any metallurgical test work that you've done in terms of the concentrate quality and therefore its suitability for the uh, for the battery market versus some of the the, the latter nickel deposits. Uh, uh, some of the other you know, the pig irons that are actually not suitable for nickel is not suitable for use in the um, the battery market. So can you just briefly outline you know the, the work that you've done and, and whether it is suitable. Sure. Yeah, no, the, one of the advantages of these low grade ultra matrix, you know, obviously the low grade is, is not particularly helpful, but the mineralogy of these deposits is such that, um, you know, basically all of the sulfides are nickel sulfides for the most part, and you have very little iron sulfide. So you're able to make a very high grade nickel concentrate. So, you know, we'll, we'll be looking on average, you know, you know, around 25%. We're actually looking at creating two separate concentrates one that's closer to 35 to 40%, another one that's 10 to 15%, one tailored to the battery market, one tailored to the stainless steel market. Um, and, and what the battery market you know, really cares about is, is the iron and MGO content of that concentrate. You know, that's, that's what they, you know, takes them additional effort to strip out in their, in their processing plants. But, you know, what, what um, you know, from my past life discussions and, and continuing now is, you know, what they want is, is large deposits, this, you know, where they can stick a processing plant between that mine and the, and and the uh, and and the consumer because you know Tesla in the battery day presentation made it very clear it's you know you, you need to dissolve it once you keep it in solution and you 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 know basically get it into a, a, as close to an end product as possible before you you know take it out of solution uh, um, and, and precipitate it and so you know that's the opportunity I think for us um, where we are in Timmins and and the, the nature of our concentrate is is very amenable to to be able to, to supply the battery industry. R roughly what percentage would be uh, of revenue would come from the battery uh, suitable material versus the, uh, the materials it's not? 
Yeah, I think what we're probably looking at, it's obviously early days, but probably somewhere sort of 50-50 split between the sort of battery suitable concentrate and the more stainless steel suitable concentrate. Sure, thanks very much. Okay. Um, do we have a question from, um, do we have a question from our other investor? Philip, do you have a question? Um, look, you know, uh, Mark, you mentioned your, um, your experience with Dumont, and I was just wondering if there are any specific characteristics of, um, of Crawford that, you know, that's unique to it um, as compared to Dumont, or are they very much similar deposits? Yeah, no, yeah, no that's a good question. Um, they are, they're largely similar, um, but two key differences. One is, is sort of this, you know, sort of larger, higher grade core. You know, Dumont, we had higher grade blocks within the model, but we didn't really have this sort of sort of large, consistent, higher grade core, which obviously helps in terms of, you know, getting more higher grade tons earlier into the mine life. And this, the second part of it is, um, you know, we have more iron in the deposit, roughly 50% more, um, which leads to 50% more magnetite. So whereas magnetite is, is, a, um, is an opportunity um, in the uh, Dumont feasibility study, well, magnetite production will be part of the base case for our project. So that's the, those are the two key differences. Yeah, okay. And, and uh, uh, just, uh, I think we're coming up here, uh, we're going to, to move on to the next speaker, but Mark, um, you, have, you have PGMs associated with, with your project, uh, some of which were fairly newly discovered, not necessarily expected. Uh, do you see this being a, a major producer of, of PGMs? Yeah, no, it, it's, um, again, it's, 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 it's related to, but separate from the nickel deposit. So, yeah, no, you know, we, it'll be, end up uh, probably in the high tens of thousands of ounces, potentially, of, of PGMs if, you know, what we think there does show up, uh, you know, as we continue to drill this off. Obviously, the nickel is the focus, but, you know, it'll be a sizable PGM, sort of 50% palladium, 50% platinum resource by the time we're done. Got a lot of good metals in the mix, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, definitely. All right. Well, th thank you for that. Um, yeah, you know, the, uh, it's actually a good segue, uh, PGMs. Uh, next up, we have uh, Harry Barr. And uh, Harry Barr is the CEO of New Age Metals. And New Age Metals, as I mentioned, has uh, a palladium uh, pal platinum property uh, up close to Sudbury. It's uh, uh, one of the largest, uh, if not, you tell me, Harry, but one of the largest uh, deposits of palladium in Canada. And uh, certainly a reason why we invested in Harry's company back uh, just over, just under, sorry, a year ago. Um, and, uh, but you've also got a lithium project. Um, so uh, if you wanted to, to uh, um, say a few words, Harry, I'm sure people would love to hear about your project. It's, uh, it's, it's another one um, that's got a lot of blue sky, a lot of upside to it. Uh, and we're working with Harry actually to try and maximize uh, the value back to shareholders uh, on those on those projects. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, Andrew, for organizing everything. Appreciate it. I'll just bring up the first slide. A um, couple things to point out here. Um, the picture on the right is Sudbury, well, I guess our biggest metallurgical complex in Canada. Um, yeah, just back to the first slide, please. And um, two major companies there who could take our concentrates. There's only one uh, producing mine in Ontario and Canada right now, PGMs, and it successfully shipped its concentrates over a thousand kilometers um, to Sudbury for 20 years now. It started as an open pit, it's now underground. Sudbury creates PGMs as a byproduct to its nickel and copper. So everything we need as a mining company is within 100 kilometers from us. From assay companies, the drillers, engineering companies, uh, metallurgical companies, just you couldn't ask for a better spot. Uh, we have agreements with our two native groups that we're working with who uh, uh, understand mining because it's been going on for over 130 to 40 years in the Sudbury district. Um, on the left side you see an outcrop on our property. We've got 16 kilometers of mineralization this outcrop runs, uh, we did a bulk sample a few years back, uh, three to five grams, but it shows you the mineralization still comes to surface. Uh, road accessible, uh, power, uh, absolutely everything that a junior mining company needs. Most of the um, 
PGMs in the world come from South Africa and Russia. So having a deposit of this kind uh, in Canada, especially this close to a center, a mining center that can take our concentrates is, is uh, something uh, that most companies I think would like to have. I saw in our survey that nobody voted anything for PGMs. And a couple of years ago, I said, uh, I don't think people can spell palladium or understand what it is, but about 85% of it is used in your car's tailpipe in the auto catalyst. And it's a green, um, basically anti-pollution metal that more and more is getting added to cars uh, as the uh, standards get tougher and tougher around the world. So um, I, I don't know if anyone's followed the price of uh, palladium, but it's about $2,300 US. It's done exceptionally well in the last year or two, trading ahead of gold. And most analysts believe that there's uh, several years, uh, it's basically been in deficit since 2012, and there's several more years of that to come. So we'll see how that goes. But a good space to be in. Platinum hit $1,000 today. We also have copper, nickel, cobalt, and gold in the project. So there's several metals. Next slide, please. So just an overview, we're one of the largest undeveloped primary palladium deposits in North America. About 70% of these prices uh, of the payable metals are palladium, platinum second, gold third, and we've got copper, nickel, cobalt. We have a multi-million ounce asset to date, just under three million ounces in measure um, in the top two categories, and uh, about a million ounces uh, in the lower category. So altogether close to 4 million ounces. We do have rhodium on the project and we're just doing a test right now. Unfortunately, in the old days, we didn't do enough assaying for rhodium. Rhodium traded as high as $16,000 an ounce this week. So it could be a very important metal in the project. We did do several hundred assays, rhodium came up. We're currently doing a rhodium program where we've just sent in the first 300 new assays for rhodium and other metals. And we're hoping to be able to bring at least 5% of the uh, rhodium on the project into a payable metal. Again, a super infrastructure with roads and rail links to Sudbury. Lots of exploration upside, both along the 16 kilometers. We've done some modern day geophysics in the last two years and come up with nine new targets just in the top three or four kilometers. So it'd be a series of open pits to start with over the 16 kilometers. And we completed a PEA last year and there were recommendations made and we're currently working on those recommendations to move to the pre-feasibility level. We're hoping to get uh, starting that study by the end of the second quarter next year. So we believe we're one of the most undeveloped deposits of its kind in North America when you look at our market capitalization. Next slide, please. A second division in the company um, is in Manitoba. It's a lithium division. Uh, we own 100% of a wholly owned sub that has eight different projects. If you can see in the middle of the uh, slide there, there's a black and white area that's just called the Tanko Mine. We were able to hire the VP of Exploration for over 11 years of that mine, and it had done tantalum and cesium, and still produces cesium today, but always had a lot of lithium and stockpiled in their tailings since 1969. And so a lot of the areas that you see in red uh, were formerly owned by Tanko and through the assistance of our geologists and consultant, we were able to pick up uh, eight different projects. So we're the largest landholder in one of the uh, biggest uh, pegmatite fields in Canada. It's completely underexplored. Two of the projects we've taken to the drill stage and are working towards applications and we're uh, for drilling right now. We also, uh, are working towards getting a joint venture on the property and we have several groups that are interested. So our plan is to bring in a partner and help us uh, fund uh, this uh, division. Uh, and as Michael said earlier, we don't think we're getting any value for it right now, but we own 100% of uh, the largest group of claims in the Winnipeg uh, River Pigmatite field right now. Next slide, please. So just to summarize, I'm very proud of our veteran board of engineers and and geologists, uh, we have two fellows uh, that spent their whole life with Anglo Platinum. One is a board member, one is a, a consultant. Um, we have Dr. Bill Stone in Toronto, who is a well-known uh, PGM and nickel uh, consultant, uh, heads up the project. And everything we need in, is in Sudbury. We have a, a, a veteran geologist who's helped us for many years in the project there. 
What separates us and makes us a little different is we've got two green metal divisions, both platinum group metals and lithium. We do have a project we own 100% in Alaska that's at the drill stage. And um, we're the largest uh, claim holder in this uh, Winnipeg uh, uh, field of uh, pegmatites. Uh, excellent exploration upside in both divisions. We're not by any means drilled out on our PGM division and we're just getting going on the lithium division. So we think there's a real disconnect between our market valuation today and the contained metals we have in the ground. Every million ounces of PGMs or palladium equivalent you have is about $2 billion US of metal in the ground. Well, that's a quick overview. Thank you, Harry. Thank you very much. Uh, we just have a question here from the audience, and, and actually I thought that I would turn to you, Philip, to, to perhaps address it. It says, uh, what will happen to demand for palladium as cars electrify, no exhaust catalyst demand? Do you have, do you have a view, Philip, on sort of a, a, a forecast for palladium where you think it might be headed? Or Yeah, look, I mean, that is... Um... You know, it's a point that uh, that often gets made with sort of a you know a negative connotation on on PGMs because you don't need the PGMs in the uh, catalytic converters on EV um, vehicles, obviously. Um, look, you know, ICE you know, internal combustion vehicles um, are still going to dominate for for a long time. Like we're, we're definitely seeing an increase in EV. But in the meantime, what we're seeing, and Harry mentioned this, is a push towards cleaner emissions, right? So higher emission standards, and that just means an increased loading in catalytic converters for you know, all the PGMs, platinum, palladium, and uh, rhodium especially, right? Um, so we're quite bullish on PGMs um, in, in the medium term and the long term of fish supply. Uh, deficit, you have a jurisdictional risk overlay on top of that with, you know, as Harry mentioned, most of the production coming from South Africa and Russia. Um, and it's actually quite difficult as a fund for us to get um, exposure to PGMs, right, in, in first world jurisdictions. Uh, so, so we're quite bullish on it. Um, yeah, you know, I don't see, I don't see the EV um, uh, market really negatively impacting PGMs in the in the near to medium term, so we're we're bullish on it. Um, I would say like probably we prefer platinum a bit more over palladium in the near term. Um, just you know, palladium and rhodium have both gone gangbusters if you look at the prices. Um, typically at a five hundred dollar an ounce spread between platinum and palladium, um, some of the manufacturers start looking at substitution, but you cannot substitute all of the palladium component in the catalyst um, for platinum. Uh, it works more so on the lower temperature side uh, of the catalytic, catalytic converter. So um, I think there is, uh, in, the, in the near term, there's uh, probably a more bullish case on the platinum side than the palladium, but PGMs overall, um, I think, is yeah, very, very strong market indicators going forward. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've, I've uh talking to people in the industry, the auto industry, they, they also add that uh, in terms of, of substitution, it's, it's a little bit more difficult than some people think to swap palladium and platinum for each other uh, because it goes to also the configuration of the car and the placement of the exhaust and the catalytics and all, you know, all that good stuff. So it's, it's a fair bit of, of retooling and redesign to, to swap one for the other. Um, um, yeah, so and actually, the certification on top of that is actually what takes the longest time. Um, so just getting yeah, the new, as you say, sort of configuration certified, that, that adds that lag. So kind of working through that at the moment. <laughs> Wonderful. We're, we're certainly bullish on it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fine if we just get stability. It's amazing sometimes to see the spread and the bid and the ask with palladium, and it's been up nicely in the last six months, uh, back up to 2300 or so, 2370, I think it was today. But uh, um, Rick and Emily, uh, do you have any questions of, of Harry um, regarding his PGM deposit or his lithium deposit? Yeah, I've just got a quick one. Uh, uh, ASX listed company Chalice made a, a, an amazing discovery early this year, the Julimar deposit. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, first world jurisdiction, high grades. But the, one of the things that really distinguishes it from many of its uh, uh, competitors out there is the preliminary uh, uh, MET test work show, shows that it's actually quite positive and that's something that's held back uh, quite a few of the other 
uh, known discoveries that, that, are, that are out there elsewhere in the world or the undeveloped deposits, because there are quite a few of them. So can you just briefly, uh, sort of two points, can you briefly uh, uh, comment on the, uh, on, on the re recoveries in the, any um, uh, 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 concentrate quality uh, uh, data for your deposit, but also, you know, what impact uh, that might have, because there's, obviously they've found what, what potentially could be a new, new province and, uh, you know, sort of re really change up that mix and, and probably make it a little bit more uh, difficult for, for competitors in the space. Well, traditionally, if we follow the only producer in, in Canada, Lactazeal, they, they started, I think, in the high 70s recovery, and palladium typically was high 70s, about 80%. Um, I haven't seen for a few months, but I know they got into the 82 plus percent recently. Um, we've done a lot of testing when we had a partner Anglo Platinum, but that's all non 43101 stuff now. So we did our last study in 213 and we were about 78%. Uh, recently, I've been following a company called Generation who have uh, done a lot of work on metallurgy. They're ahead of us in the sense they're doing a, a feasibility study now, and they uh, claimed uh, this week on a call similar to this, 87%. So I think if we can get into that 80% range or better, and that's what we hope for, um, it, it'll be a viable project. I guess uh, my for both uh, Mike and Harry, uh, you, you both mentioned that the company is undervalued. I wonder if you could give your thoughts on why that is and, and maybe what you're going to be doing to, to increase um, the value that the market sees in the company. Well, you know, it's funny. The little study today might have told us something. Did you see what it said for yeah. platinum metals? Zero. Even so does that mean that people don't even know what it is? And, and again, I kind of go back to that. A couple of years ago, I had to help people spell palladium and try to tell them what it, what it was for. And, you know, I think 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, people understood more about it than they do today. So I think there's a, certainly a lack of understanding. There's only a few of us in Canada and the U.S. that are, are looking for PGMs. So there's a, a much smaller audience than there is gold and silver. And part of it is kind of where we're stuck in that, uh, that chart, uh, you know, where we're doing pre-feasibility and soon on to feasibility study. And it's, a, it's kind of the, you know, you're lost in, a, in, the, in the woods right there in terms of people wondering what's going on and following the stock. So it's all of those reasons. Mm. And yeah, the, the, other, the other way to, to look at it would be uh, just in terms of value, uh, you know, with, with Palladium up at twenty three hundred plus dollars an ounce. As Harry advances his project, and, and as we can get uh, parties um, on the ground, which has been been kind of a, a one of the um, I guess one of the uh, uh, issues that uh, we've had over the last year in terms of of um, of trying to um, realize on the value of this company. It's to get industry. Uh, interested in the project, they are interested. But as that interest needs to 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 develop uh, into an actionable uh, approach, and they need to do due diligence. And so this last year with COVID nineteen uh, has been difficult to get these teams, literally they're around the world, uh, into Sudbury and and focused on on Harry's project. Um, that will happen at some point. Like I said, there there certainly is interest in this deposit. There's interest in Ontario. There's interest in diversification of jurisdiction uh, in terms of potential production of PGMs away from some of the traditional producers to uh, a stable environment like Ontario, Canada. And so, as as you as you advance the project and as you potentially have this this industry participation, you can start increasing the value of those ounces that are in the ground. And we'd we'd like to see, you know, even a a percentage of of value um, uh, for his uh, PGEs in the ground. Um, even just 1% of 2,300 is $23 uh, uh, an ounce. And uh, with uh, 4 million ounces, that's $100 million worth of value right there. So, um, yeah. you know, we, we, can start, we can start to see, we can start to understand how, how this uh, project can, can uh, uh, produce value uh, as we go forward here over the next uh, year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, um, we're, we're just 
we're see, the time seems to be melting away here. So we've got to we've got to move on, which is fantastic. Thank you very much, Harry. By the way, uh, Thank great you. presentation. And and I'm sorry to the audience. There were a few more questions there. Uh, we just um, couldn't couldn't get to them. Um, but there may be time after uh, uh, the final presentation here to go back, perhaps. But uh, I'll let our our leader there, Andrew, guide me in that respect. So next up, we we have uh, we're staying in the Sudbury area of of uh, Ontario, Canada. Um, it's the 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 new to be public player in the nickel space, a uh, company that we're equally uh, excited uh, for in terms of the prospects going forward, and that's SPC Nickel. Uh, we've got the CEO here today, uh, Grant Moore, and uh, this is really uh, um, uh, where where Mark Selby has lots and lots of tons uh, at a good at a at a good grade. I think uh, I'll let Grant get into it, but you know he's looking for more of the traditional. Uh, style, you know, high grade uh, type uh, Sudbury uh, nickel deposits, and uh, they've got themselves a great suite uh, of, of projects, and uh, it, it's really the time for them to begin, um, you know, pushing hard on the on the exploration front, uh, foot on the gas, as some people say. Um, I it's a private company, so Grant, I'm going to disclose this, you know, to the audience. Uh, you you went out to raise three and a half million. And I think in a day we had it at seven million dollars in terms of the book. So this this is a company that's uh, uh, certainly well sponsored and well backed by uh, the market and by the money people. Um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know being being able to raise money that quickly and way more money than you thought you would get. So we're super excited to have you start. As I mentioned, it's going to be public in uh, February of 2021. And uh, we'll get into a little bit of the value on that side of things in terms of where you think it might trade. But Grant, take it away. Let's hear more about SBC Nickel. Uh, thanks, Mike and Andrew, for setting this up. Um, I mean, you guys are doing all the work for me here, uh, describing the company and explaining Sudbury for me. But, uh, you know, as Mike said, we're a little bit earlier uh, in the stage compared to, uh, to Mark's company and Harry's company. But uh, right now, I mean, a company is called Sudbury, uh, um, sorry, SBC Nickel. And we are a, a private junior exploration company focused in nickel, but primarily focused on assets, uh, some key assets we have within the Sudbury Basin. And as Mike pointed out, uh, you know, we, we are planning or we're mid process of the way through the uh, public listing, which is expected to happen in, you know, February, March of 2021. Um, as you mentioned, we've, uh, you know, our financing went exceedingly well, exceeded our expectations. Um, I think we had uh, we ended up with 7.6 million dollars in in just over a week. So that was a reaction that we weren't expecting, but I think it just shows the excitement that people have for nickel moving forward, and also for the fact that uh, you know it's it's challenging for junior companies to get a foothold into one of these established nickel camps like Sudbury, which is arguably the uh, the top nickel camp in the world next maybe to only Norilsk in Russia. So if we just go to the next slide, advance maybe two slides. So just you know some of the, some of the points about SPC that we think make it an interesting company and a company to follow is you know we've got a pretty good uh, and strong management and board of directors. We've got a, a proven and relevant track record of success not only in nickel and precious metals but also in Sudbury. You know we've been uh, awarded a couple awards for discoveries in Sudbury and also for precious metals discoveries in Ontario. Uh, as Mark pointed out, uh, you know, we're, we're at the beginning of what could be a very exciting super cycle for nickel. And, you know, traditionally in the past, a lot of nickel, junior nickel companies have gotten into the nickel game at the end or the middle or the end of the cycle, just to have it end up uh, in tragedy. But I think we're starting at a really good situation right now with where the forecasts have nickel going. And, you know, in our opinion, the one, you know, the component that makes us a little bit different than some of the other uh, junior nickel companies out there is that we are exploring within the Sudbury Basin, which is, which is one of the top nickel camps in the world. And we've been fortunate over the years to be able to assemble a couple advanced stage projects within some really good jurisdictions within the basin that we feel have the opportunity and the potential to have high grade uh, high value discoveries. So whereas, you know, Mark's company 
is looking more for the large, really large deposits. In Sudbury, we're focused mainly more on, on the, you know, although there are some very large deposits, but it's, it's more of the value per ton that these deposits can bring. And, um, you know, and last, the, you know, our kind of growth that we see, because we're in, in a really good cash position right now, uh, we're going to be very aggressive on the exploration front. Uh, so soon as soon after listing, we'll have the drills turning, and we've probably got a 18 to 24 month exploration program planned on our three properties. And uh, you know, hopefully, we're generating a lot of continuous news that'll help drive our share price up and get our market cap up into some of our uh, uh, our peer group, maybe even into the uh, area that uh, Mark's Canadian Nickel Company is sitting. Uh, next slide. So, you know, I think most people are probably familiar with Sudbury, but this is a, this is a picture of the Sudbury Basin. It's located about 40, uh, four hours north of Toronto. Um, and as I said, it's, you know, one of the premier nickel camps in the world. It's had product, continuous production over about 125 years. Um, you know, there's currently eight producing mine, underground mines in Sudbury. Uh, you know, there's two smelters, there's two mills, there's a nickel refinery. So, and all the infrastructure that you need to develop something is here in Sudbury. You know, and it's big. I mean, the total total combined tonnage from production and resources is, you know, you're talking about one and a half billion tons of ore that's either in the ground or been mined out of the ground. But the deposits here are typically, uh, you know, high grade massive sulfide deposits that occur around the edge of this basin. And uh, we've been able to put together two what we feel are really quality assets in, in the basin. One is called our Air Kid project, and the other is the Lockerbie East. And the, uh, the Air Kid project is in one of the more active jurisdictions in the basin, and that's down in the, just in the south, southwest corner of this image. And this one is just bookmarked by two world-class deposits. On, on one side of us, we have uh, the, the most recent uh, mine in Sudbury, which is Valet's Totten Mine which was put in production in 2012, or sorry, I think 2010. And, you know, it's a, it's a fairly large, but really high grade deposit. You know, you're talking over 10 million tons with about three and a half percent combined nickel copper, but also a lot of precious metals. So, you know, Sudbury isn't just a nickel camp. It's got as much copper as nickel and, and it's got a, a, you know, a very substantial amount of precious metals, both platinum and palladium. And, and then on the other side of our Air Kid property is the uh, probably the highest grade undeveloped deposit in the basin, and that's uh, KGHM's Victoria deposit, which is in in development stage right now. And that's just uh, you know a, a magnificent deposit. It's over 14 million tons as it stands right now. That's most likely going to grow significantly more when they get underground. But you know the combined grades of that are are five percent nickel copper combined, and you know you're talking eight grams of precious metals. So, I think the in situ metal value of that deposit is something around twelve billion dollars. Its ore is uh, nine hundred dollar a ton ore. So you know although these mines in Sudbury are deep, you know they're mining down uh, twenty five hundred three thousand meters. Uh, the value of this ore makes it economic. And uh, the other property that we have uh, is what we call our uh, Lockerbie East property. And again, this is in another great jurisdiction. Uh, it, it's a little bit more advanced than the Air Kid property and the fact that it actually has reserves on uh, resources on surface. Uh, and it's beside two past producing mines. So there's still the uh, underground infrastructure is available. You know, all the power, water, everything is there. And that's another project that will be, uh, will be advancing come the new year. And, and we have a third project uh, that's just located southwest, uh, southeast of Sudbury, which actually Harry might be familiar with. Is he had, uh, it used to be a project that he was involved with, and that's a, a more of a, a precious metal, platinum, palladium, nickel, copper project that we've been uh, actively working on this year. And uh, I've had some pretty uh, tremendous results from it that we'll be following up with drilling in the, uh, in the coming year. So uh, next slide. So just kind of the corporate snapshot. I mean, like I said, we're, we're, we're still a private company. We're early in the stage. Uh, we did go out and raise, uh, you know, seven and a half million dollars. So, you know, our treasury is in good shape at almost nine million dollars. Um, we're coming out with a market cap of around 22 million. 
And uh, we certainly think that that's uh, given us a lot of room to grow into some of our peers, uh, other nickel sulfide exploration companies within within Canada. So we, we, we feel like we got a lot of uh, a lot of potential coming out of the gates. Uh, we're going to have a really uh, you know aggressive exploration program because we're well funded right now and we have some really good backers. So you know we've got about three and a half million dollar exploration program that'll be initiated at Air Kid uh, right away and that's going to be looking for a Totten Victoria size deposit that we think you know the property's got all the geological merit to hold. So we're excited about that. And then we'll be advancing uh, our genes and uh, Lockerbie project as well. Uh, so that's, uh, that sums that up. Okay, I think we've got time to go and take some questions from the audience, uh, some uh, questions from the audience. But perhaps I could turn to our investors first. Uh, Emily, do you have a question for Grant? I guess I would just refer back to the earlier presentation. Do you have any similar concerns about the, the carbon issue affiliated with your deposit? Well, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're very early in the stage, uh, so it's not our immediate focus now. But I guess the one thing I would say is, you know, given that we're in a, an established mining camp, you know, we're... We're, we're, you know, we're in, the, we're in the luxury where the major companies in the basin get to do all the heavy lifting and get to figure a lot of this stuff out. I mean, just just recently, uh, you know, Valet invested one and a half billion dollars into their Copper Cliff smelter to reduce emissions by 85 percent. And and in fact, the iconic super stack of Sudbury is no longer in use anymore. And, and it's actually gonna be torn down because they don't need it anymore. And uh, so, you know, the, the, they were investing money into the mill complexes to reduce, uh, you know, the waste that comes out. Uh, the new mines that are being developed by Glencore right now called the Onaping Depth Mine. It's a, it's a deep mine that starts at about 2,500 meters. But, and because of the depth, they're gonna build a fully electric mine. So. We have the luxury that, you know, if we're successful in finding a deposit, all of that infrastructure and, and that work that the big companies put in will be a bit available for us in Sudbury. Yeah, so it lifts everybody in the district. Which is exactly. Yeah. Do you have a question from uh, Rick? I, I have a question if I can jump in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Brent, you, you, touched, you touched on it during your presentation. Um, you know, in terms of uh, where, you, where you thought you might um, trade uh, based on your peer group. Uh, can, you, can you just m maybe uh, get into a little bit more detail uh, based on the money that you raised, based on the pre-money value, you have a, a value of about 22 million. When, yeah. when, when you launch and you're, you're publicly traded on the TSX venture, where do you think you will be trading in terms of market value based on your peer group or what could you get to once the once the you know right out of the gate once once you're properly sponsored yeah. once people understand that you're now public and you're trading you know mark selby went through this uh when he went public it wasn't overnight that he went to two dollars a share you know he kind of had to make that movement to 50 cents and then a dollar and then and then it kind of took off from there so where do you think you'll go out of the gate from a 22 million dollar value to well, I'd like to say that we'll follow in Mark's footsteps and end up in the same spot, but obviously that's going to take some effort. Uh, you know, we've looked at, we've looked at a, you know, there's, there's kind of a maybe five or six other uh, nickel exploration companies in North America that we've kind of compared ourselves to. And, uh, you know, and, and the market's caps range from anywhere from 30 million to 150 million, which would be Mark's company. But there's kind of a cluster of, of companies in and around the 50, 60 million dollar market cap, and then there's some up uh, closer to 100 million, you know, 90 to 100 million. And you know, if I'm giving my personal opinion on things, I, I think our assets in Sudbury are as good or better than the assets of those companies. And I think the upside that we have uh, far outweighs theirs. And given that we're as well financed as we are right now. You know, I would like to see us move into those, uh, you know, into the comparables with those groups, you know, maybe into that 50, $60 million market cap. And then with continued success, 
we can move uh, even higher. You know, there's, there hasn't been, there's only been a few examples of, uh, of junior companies within Sudbury. And, and the one that kind of sticks out is the, is the FNX mining story. And, and yeah, it was it certainly, uh, you know, they had a slightly different property position than we do now, but it just shows that when they came into Sudbury, you know, almost uh, 20 years ago, I think they were a $2 company. And, and I think eventually they ended up at, you know, 30, $35. And, and it just shows that, you know, the quality of the deposits that you can find in Sudbury, there's so much value there that, you know, if we, if we're able to drill into a Totten or a Victoria style deposit, you know, I really think that there's a tremendous amount of potential for us to grow and, uh, and a huge amount of upside. Thank you. Um, anybody, uh, Philip or, or Rick, did you have any? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah sure. Uh, Grant, I see there, I think you earmarked is at three and a half million uh, of Q1 spending <laughs> on their kid. Um, just wondering how much drilling you're, you're going to do and when those results will come out. Uh, well, it's, uh, that, that's, a, that's the uh, three and a half million is the initial program that we have planned at Air Kit starting in Q1. Mm -hmm. So that'll be about a 20, 15 to 20,000 meter program. And, uh, you know, that will take us probably 12 to 12 to 18 months to carry out. I mean, these are deep holes. So they do take a long time to drill. Uh, we're hopefully that we can ramp up to multiple drills, but uh, you know, there's a lot of competition in Sudbury from the major companies for equipment. So we're hoping we can secure, uh, or we have secured two drills at least. So that should keep us, uh, keep us busy. Um, you know, and, and obviously with success, we can ramp up, we should be able to ramp up a lot faster. So uh, you know, the, the holes, like I said, are deep. So I would expect that, uh, you know, once we start drilling, it'll probably be in the order of maybe four weeks before we'll start having our first results. And we've, uh, we've got some shallower targets and some deeper targets. So we'll kind of be mixing those up. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, there are some questions here from the audience. Yeah, I see there's a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, there are. There are a bunch of them. If we've got time, Andrew, I'd like to Go yeah, on. I mean, I think I think that what I think that um, you know what I would maybe sort of like suggest is if we've got about five minutes to go, is maybe like whilst um, Grant is just answering some of those unanswered questions in the chat box, I think there's also one there for you as well, Mark. As well, we could perhaps maybe I don't know if you've the final five minutes, uh, Mike. Just want to go back to the investors and perhaps ask about their investment outlook for 2021 and what key themes they're sort of seeing. And in that five minutes, while we get Emily Rick and Philip's view on that, that will give uh, Grant time and also Mark time just to answer those questions in the chat box. Okay, sure, that sounds good. So uh, Grant and Mark, you're, you're okay doing that? You can, you can answer those questions then online. Yep. Yeah, okay, perfect. Well, uh, Emily, do you want us to start with you? Let's hear your sure. outlook. <laughs> I, well, from Florida, it's pretty sunny most of the time. But uh, yeah, so no, I'm I'm really excited about 2021. I think everything's looking really very positive for the industry. What I've been seeing at this conference and others is a lot of great projects getting attention that maybe earlier this year they weren't. Uh, so I'm excited to see where the industry is headed. And I'm also on the on the investor side with the work we do with prospectors, seeing a lot of new capital take a look at the market. And that to me is a really positive sign, it means different ways of thinking, uh, new money. Uh, and uh, I think that's going to make it for a really interesting and positive 2021. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's always a great time when you when you transition into these bull markets. You always get uh, not necessarily new names, obviously some new names, but you also get some older names that that uh, really shine and take off and create a lot of value. And, and certainly that's what we believe. We believe that we're we're, we're in, in that transition right now. And, uh, and for that reason, there's an awful lot of money that's gonna be made over the next few years on, on these names. And certainly I put uh, a lot into these three names right here in terms of uh, the upside potential I believe I see in them. Rick, do you have anything to add to uh, in terms of the outlook? Uh, any, anything you see, anything you wanna talk about? Uh, I, I, I share uh, Emily, Emily's sentiment that uh, you know, Acorn and me personally, we're we're pretty uh, uh, bullish on, on on next year. We we think there's a uh, you know, great opportunity. You know, we really like that 
the, the, the theme that we're talking about today, that sort of the EV metal uh, market, you know, we're still uh, uh, positive on, on gold. So we think, you know, just part of the portfolio mix, it's important to be diversified because it's so hard to pick, you know, pick where the winners will be in terms of the commodity. So, you know, we like to have a, uh, a, a, a nice spread a, across them, but, uh, you know, we're really quite positive on the, um, on, on the developers. We, we think that, uh, you know, it's been, they've been really starved of capital all over the, the last sort of six to eight years that, uh, you know, now it's really the, the opportunity for the, you know, sorts of the companies that we've, we've heard from today that, you know, that's the really the, the space for, uh, for, for growth potential from, from uh, in, in the sector. So, so that's an area where we're looking at uh, very carefully and, and, and think there's great opportunities. But to pick the winner, it's uh, really important to, to, uh, to, to pick, uh, pick, pick the best quality asset. Uh, that 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 is still key at the end of the day is is, is is in terms of our thinking. Quality asset, quality people, absolutely. That's what you want to be investing in. That's what you want to back. Philip, take it away. Yeah, I mean, you know, looking at the market, I think yeah, we're definitely in a in a buoyant space. Uh, a lot of money flowing in, especially in the precious metal sector, which unfortunately makes it a bit tough for PE sometimes to get priced out um, when a lot of retail money flows in. Um, we also take a bit of a longer view, so you know, not looking to, you know, get in and out within a year's time, um, and then so in that vein and sticking with the theme of sort of the EVs and you know the the battery metals, um, for investment entries in 2021, um, I actually think lithium is a good space. Um, lithium has sort of come full circle. You know, there was massive investment and that led to oversupply in 17, 18. Um, we've seen prices come down, um, but you know the future outlook for lithium is great. So yeah, I think that's probably space for us to focus on 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 actually deploying capital. Interesting, very interesting. Okay, well, um, Andrew, is there uh, is there anything that uh, we need to hear from the audience? I guess I guess all questions are being addressed. Um, yeah, I think that. Yeah, I think that all the questions have been now answered by Grant and uh, Mark. So I think they managed to sort of like get around to everyone. I also see that we're obviously now up to the hour or so mark. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think that all that remains me to, for me to do is obviously firstly to go and thank you, Mike, for being such a great host. Thank you to uh, IBK Capital for their uh, support. Also, thank you to Resource Global Network. Also, once again, to our, um, also, like, once again, a big thank you to our six guests. And I really hope that all of you go and enjoy the rest of our Minds and Money Online Global Show. So, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, thank you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do this again.